Hey guys, welcome back to Prepping in Progress. I'm Steve. And I'm Kim. And today we wanted to debate and discuss... Prepping for other people. Do we have to? That's the question. <laughs> so stay with us. Alright guys, I want to apologize. We are driving again. We're always kind of... It feels like we're always on the road, right? Well, for the last six weeks, I've been home one weekend. But we're actually... We're heading up to for a supply run. Uh, you know, north, opsec stuff. But uh, we were discussing uh, one of your favorite books. I don't know if you say favorite, but an interesting book. Now, of all the prepper fiction, um, that book is probably one of my favorites. Uh, we're, we were talking about Franklin Horton's Locker 9. I, don't get me wrong, I like Grace Under Fire, the second book in the series, but Locker 9... Gets you thinking. ...really blows my mind, every, and I learn something new every time I read it. Definitely. And for people that have not read it, the premise is um, the... Dad is a prepper. Right? Prepper author. Prepper author. Well known. And he has a college age daughter, right? Yes. And she doesn't really have the ability to prep in her dorms and things like that. Having said that, she's been backpacking with him, earned her trail name on the Appalachian Trail. She is a highly capable young lady. Trained up child in the way she should go. <laughs> but because she can't prep the way, you know, she thinks she should be able to, the dad does it for her, and that is the premise of the locker of Locker 9. Yeah, he's given her a gold chain, I believe, with a key on it, and said, just never take this off. You'll know when to use it. And the key goes to a like storage locker? A storage locker nearby, one of those rent by the month things. Um, which is it's really cool because there's no identifying marks on the key. He's just engraved into it the GPS coordinates. Which is really cool. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you could do the same thing with just just telling her, hey, if something goes wrong, head to that locker, use that key. No. <laughs> but <laughs> no. Opsec. Opsec. I mean tell her. No. no. Okay. But anyways, it got us kind of discussing, do you prep for other people in your life? You know, I prep for everybody in this vehicle, definitely. Yeah. And that, to me, that is my responsibility. Our responsibility as parents is to prep for each other. So we are around to be able to take care of the other ones that we prep for. Yeah, like the, the sleepy head. The sleepy right head. There. <laughs> He'll be so mad. <laughs> is that drool going down? <laughs> <laughs> but that's our responsibility as parents. Um, and even when they go off to college, I, I hope to be able to do something very similar to, to Locker 9 um, and having ways for them to be able to get home. And when they get home, there will be supplies waiting for them there as well. Yeah. Um, just because I see that as my responsibility as a parent. But there are other people in our lives who... Are, are what you call not really switched on to the whole prepping lifestyle. Um, they may be very cool with it, may be very, very comfortable with it. You know, um, we talked about family members in your other video um, about the unsuspected members yeah. uh, of your kind of prepping tribe. Sorry, I'm changing lanes. Give me a minute. <laughs> but people that we love, people that we care for, but they aren't necessarily stockpiling food. Yeah. They may have wonderful skills, but not only that, they just may be somebody who we love and adore and want to make sure they are okay. Um, I can think of one example. It would be your parents. They have very much a prepper mindset. And they've, and they've got the working pantry down. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the long-term pantry or the, you know, 
two years worth of stuff on but they probably got a couple of months easy and have to get them through a short term disaster and yeah. things like that but if something catastrophic were to happen they would most likely have to find their way down to the bug out location yeah. and at that bug out, bug out location we have stockpiled food set aside for them yeah in addition and, to seeds and whatnot for yes. the next planting season. And I was wondering if anybody else does that. If anybody else preps for members of your family or it could be friends who you want to be in your group that aren't necessarily probably, you know, on board just yet. But are you already stockpiling and, you know, possibly, you know, saving up different items for that person? Say, we have a blacksmith friend. Yeah. Our our hope, our sincere hope, is that he will, if something happens, he will come up there with us. Yeah. But he has a family as well. So that means not only I'll have to stockpile for him, I'll have to put back food for his family that he's going to most likely bring with him. I would hope they would come with them. <laughs> that would be really weird if his family didn't come with him. Now, um, granted, he has agreed to you know, do his part as best he can on his limited budget. But I would also be stockpiling stuff that he would need for his blacksmithing. Yeah. You know, as part of things where I want him to be there. So I'm going to put stuff aside that I might not necessarily have, know how to use. But would definitely want to have it on hand for him. If you have an electrician friend, you would really like to kind of get it switched on. And maybe you're just kind of in that stage of just trying to bring them on board. Go ahead and start stockpiling some extra electrical lines and things like that, right? That that person might need that you might not necessarily know how to use. Well, you know, you're talking about supplies and stuff for them to use. Um, Travis, over at Set Apart Homestead, said something a while back. You know, he's very much of the Christian mindset where he would have a hard time turning someone away. Mm -hmm. And as he preps, he takes a tithe on his food preps. Mm -hmm. And 10% of his food preps gets set aside for, set aside homestead, gets set aside for charitable work. Charitable work. People at the gate, people who need help. And so he's already got that part of the barn, for lack of a better term, good to go for others. That's a wonderful idea. That is that is a wonderful idea. I know we can't help everybody, and there will be, I'm sure, discussions in the comments. I hope there are comments down below on whether or not you think that is a good idea to stockpile for complete strangers, to set food aside for people that you have no attachment to whatsoever. Um, and that will be whatever is put on your heart. Yeah, and of course we're going to go back to the OPSEC argument yeah. of, you know, if I give to Patty Jean, is she going to show up next week with her clan? You know, let's go back to Franklin Horton for a minute. Grace Under Fire, the second book. Um, it kind of it kind of takes place almost at the same time as the first because her father meets her at a certain location and then she goes on toward home while he gets stuck there. Well, what it... He didn't really... All he said in the first book was, well, your mom's sick, she couldn't come. In the second book, it gets into the fact that he hired a local woman to help the mother uh, through her illness, you know, cook, clean a little bit, be a, a day companion actually live on site for the couple days he thought he'd be gone well this uh, and he told her you know I'll feed, I'll pay you in food all you can eat and you know this much I'm going to give you well she shows up at her good for nothing daughter's house with all this food you know bringing a charitable donation and the daughter is a drug user, is a manipulative little person, hooked up with a drug dealer, and they track her back to 
the main character's home and try to take over the house. And no spoilers on how that ends. No spoilers. It ends at 556. <laughs> As most good stories. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and where I'm going with this is, you know, are you going to risk that? I mean, he thought this woman would be safe and a help. And she ended up causing more problems than probably... It was worth it. Well, she was worth it in the end, but still, ish. And that's where the difficult situation comes in, is, you know, who do you let in on your... Who do you bring in? Who, who do you let into your tribe? And that's a whole other topic of the kind of people that you let in. And you've really got to vet them as probably even the people that are in their circles. Yeah, because she was supposed to go home after he got back. Yeah. Period. Done. That was a temporary arrangement. You know, so not only you're vetting your tribe members and your mag members, but vetting the temps that come in. Um, and would you even have temps if they're, you know, or would you have only permanent members who fill different roles and not let temporary people come in and out? But that's a whole nother topic. Well, you know. That's, that's a whole nother topic. That's an interesting discussion, though. Let's say we were in Fort Smith and the two kids were up in Fayetteville um, in college and you were, you had Giardia. You'd gotten a hold of... Uh, Bad water. Bad water. I would have to find someone to be with you, make sure you stayed hydrated, especially if you were feverish and, you know, delirious in bed, while I went up and got the kids. You know, there would be no choice. Yeah. um, In some situations like that. So who do you bring in? Well, hopefully we've got Mag. Looking at several of you guys very, very carefully... You, you. You know who you are. You actually, take care of me. <laughs> actually, I'd probably drop you off at a certain person's house. On, probably. On the outskirts of Fayetteville. But anyways. Love you, brother. Let, let the comments flow on what you believe, you know, is your responsibility or just something that's put on your heart to say you have college-age children or even grown children with grandchildren you know, and they're not quite, I'd get to use and switched on, but they're not really open to the idea of preparedness yet. Well, here's a situation for you. Okay. Emily is in college. Emily's roommate is from our small town in southwest Arkansas. Mm-hmm. You've prepped for Emily to be able to get her way home. You've prepped her bug out bag, her meals. Do you include enough for the roommate? Mm, That's a moral dilemma. She's coming to the same place. Two is one, one is none. That is a moral dilemma of who who is getting who gets put into that circle and how much can one family do? I mean, you know, we've got your parents, like I said, we've got our two children and then, you know, Hopefully they'll grow old and get married and have kids of their own. We continue to prep for them. How much can two people do that if we're the only ones really switched on? And so you can't overextend yourself to try to feed the world. Yeah. And so I would definitely focus first and foremost on your immediate. People in this vehicle, they are my number one priority no matter what. I love you, Mom, but I'm not going to take food out of my kids' mouth to feed you. I love you. I do. You gave me life, but I gave them life, and I have their their well-being is my responsibility first and foremost. Okay. That's that's number one. That's inner circle. So what, where you're going with this, I think what I hear you saying mm-hmm. is, this is the tribe. This is the tribe. Ooh, I'm Native American. I can do that. Um, I'm not. <laughs> hey. hey, hey. So, tribe first, mag second. I'm Scottish. We say clan. This is my clan. All right. Clan first, (laughs) clan, tribe. Then, after that, mag. Well, no, not mag. 
Why not? If this is if this is my 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 tribe or, or clan or whatever you want to call it, before Mag would definitely be my extended family. Really? See, I argue. I, see, definitely. debate. Debate. Let's do this. Because I, I I do it in different tiers is because I see your parents being the next tier past these two. Okay. So we've got people in on this car first tier of people I'm taking care of. The next tier is going to be people like our parents. My brothers and sisters. You don't have any brothers and sisters, which makes it way helpful not trying to figure them out. But I do have brothers and sisters. And we both have parents still alive. And I'm not, it's even more complicated. Your parents are still together. My parents are divorced and remarried. And so that's, I have four. <laughs> you have two, so that's six extra people. I'm one of four kids, so that's three siblings plus their spouses and their children who gets put on that tier okay and that's where and that's where it gets complicated for me because in my head I know who's in the tier and I'm not going to say who's in the tier and who's not in the tier so be nice to her and Christmas is coming up yes (laughs) well but I've got like I've got grown people in that I would not put into that immediate second tier because they're more they need to be more self-reliant if they showed at my doorstep I definitely if they managed to get there they've got something going they've got something going for them okay counter yeah tribe what's in this car yes mag I consider my mom and dad because of their homesteader mindset Mm -hmm. to be mag okay um I don't consider many of my close friends growing up because they're not of the same mindset as Mag, and some of them would not be welcome. Okay. Um, I mean, these are people that so you, you, I grew up with calling brother and sister and having keys to their houses and vice versa. They would not... I would probably just have a hard time turning them away, but I would. Okay. I, I'm not prepping for them. They're not Mag. Um, versus the people that we associate with out of our Clotexahomas mag groups. The door's wide open, walk through, do you want a key? Um, okay, so you would put different family members in the category of mag. Yes. Okay, okay. I can, I can get that and kind of categorize which family members you would put into that mag category. And not just a blanket family first. Correct. Okay, I can understand that. I can understand I mean, that. There are family members, blood family members that I have, cousins and whatnot. Go away. <laughs> I don't like you. Go away. <laughs> but all right, but I want y'all guys to discuss it into the comment section below. Who all are you prepping for? And to what extent? Say I'm just putting back a, a few MREs to hand off to family members and tell them to go away. Or are, like, your parents, we are definitely putting back, you know, we, we treat them almost as as household members. Yeah. Um, and put back the same amount of food that I'd put back for us. Yeah. Um, but different tiers and different levels... Do you prep for others besides yourself? Do you prep for your spouse who may not be into prepping? You know, you may be the spouse that's switched on and your your spouse isn't, you know, into it and it's not on board. Are you prepping for that person? I guess it depends on how much you love that person or if you're wanting to be single at the end of the world. Um, that's, that's kind of dark. I'm sorry. Well, you remember... The, the one time you said well we're out of something and I went under the stairs to my stash and started pulling out I was prepping for you while we were dating yeah mm. but that's what I'm saying is you know and, and to what level and to what extent do you prep for other people and we're almost at our destination so we're going to wrap this up oh but I like them I know we're prepping for no we're not prepping for y'all <gasps> We might Maybe be prepping some for some of you. Of you. you I'll, know let y'all, who you are. I'll let y'all figure it out which ones I'm prepping for. But, anyways, guys, like, share, subscribe. Give us your thoughts definitely in the comment section below. 
let's discuss it. Let's figure it out on who are exactly are you prepping for. Alrighty, y'all. We'll talk to you later. Bye, guys.